What do you think of when you hear the term public debt? If you're familiar with the phrase, you might think about elected officials debating budgets and how to pay for goods and services. Or maybe it's a vague concept you don't fully understand. This is Christine Scalora with the Oxford Comment. For today's episode, we wanted to talk to a couple of researchers who study the effects of public debt on economies. Our first guest, Barry Eigengreen, is a professor of economics and political science at UC Berkeley and one of the authors of the newly published book, In Defense of Public Debt. The book recounts 2,000 years of public debt history, putting contemporary political concerns in context. We spoke about how the role of public debt has changed throughout history and about misconceptions of public debt. So I'm happy to be joined by Barry Eigengreen. Can you tell us a bit about yourself? I'm an economic historian and economist. I teach at the University of California at Berkeley, where I've been for more years than I wish to admit. And uh, my latest book in, in, in defense of public debt is, I think, either the fourth or fifth book I've done with OUP. So can you briefly define the term public debt? Public debt is the debt that the state owes to its creditors, often its residents, but sometimes to foreigners. And one way to think about it is to contrast the two terms that people use to describe it. One is public debt, which you just used, Christine. The other one is sovereign debt. So once upon a time, public debt was the debt of the king or the sovereign or the uh, that empowered individual to his or her creditors. And over time, uh, it evolved from being an obligation of the ruler as an individual to being an obligation of the state or the polity. So one of the things we do in the book is to trace that evolution and look at the institutions, uh, parliaments, legislatures, courts, markets that enabled that transition. And, 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 and more pragmatically, public debt is that big number that you can see on the billboard continuously updating in Times Square, or at least that we could see there before the pandemic. Yeah, um, so I think you sort of answered the question or at least started to touch on it a bit. Um, do you have anything you'd like to elaborate on in terms of how the role of public debt has changed throughout history? The role of public debt has changed and it's remained the same at the same time. Rulers, sovereigns borrowed initially mainly in order to pay armies to fight offensive and defensive wars to expand the domain of the state or to protect it against foreign invaders. And that is still one of the principal reasons why states borrow today. U.S. public debt reached its 20th century heights during World War I and World War II. But over time, the purposes for which states borrow have uh, broadened, have changed. In the 19th century, they began to borrow in order to in, in, invest in economic development. Right now, there is a debate in the United States about borrowing to finance physical infrastructure projects, ports and roads and bridges and airports. That process really began in the 19th century as governments sought to catch up with the first industrial nations by in, in investing in, in, in ports and roads and, and, and bridges and so forth to put themselves in a position where their economies could grow and export and import. In the 20th century, states have borrowed as well in order to finance social programs, social spending. When an economy turns down and the unemployed need support from the government, governments will borrow in order to make transfer payments to the unemployed. So we saw that again during the pandemic, but we saw it earlier in the United States during the Great Depression of the 1930s and during other economic downturns 
as well. So it's in, in downturns where governments have the most trouble financing their spending so on social programs and other things out of current revenues because revenues decline and they borrow in order to smooth their spending programs and continue to support uh, their constituents, residents, the population. We like to think that during the good times, they then turn around and pay down some of that additional debt, but it, it doesn't always work that way for self-evident political reasons. So what are some misconceptions about public debt maybe relating to some of those political reasons you just mentioned? I, I, I would start with the misconception that public debt is always and everywhere a burden on future generations, that current residents and, and um, politicians are borrowing and issuing debt that then has to be serviced and repaid by future generations at considerable cost to the latter. If public borrowing is put to productive ends, if it's used to effectively grow the economy, that burden is relatively light because even though there is more public debt, the economy has expanded as well. And in that sense, the burden on future generations is not heavy. So I think there's an important distinction, not frequently drawn, not evident on that billboard in Times Square. There's an important distinction between productive and unproductive borrowing. Again, that's the debate that we're having right now in the United States. What forms of borrowing to finance government spending are likely to be productive? Is there going to be a rate of return on investment in physical infrastructure that's higher than the interest cost of the additional debt, in which case there effectively is not a burden on future generations. Can we say the same thing about so-called social infrastructure? Is there a rate of return on early childhood education that's greater than the interest cost of what has to be uh, borrowed in order to finance it? A political problem of the sort I alluded to a moment ago is that retirees are often a more powerful political constituency than infants. And our societies borrow more to pay pensions to retirees typically than they borrow in order to fund high return early childhood education. I, I, I would only add that we talk about cases where governments use public debt to their detriment in the book. So one way of putting it is that uh, we try to provide a balanced account, even though we have a slightly provocative title. Another way of putting it is that a lot of the colorful uh, episodes and anecdotes are cases where public borrowing goes wrong. So we like to talk about those as well. We talk about uh, borrowing by the new Republic of Honduras in the 19th century when they borrowed repeatedly in order to build a railway what they called a dry canal to transport fully loaded ships across the isthmus, that being before the, the, the day of the Panama Canal. And it so happens that they're still trying to build that dry canal today, having defaulted on the bonds that they issued in order to borrow in the 1860s and 1870s. So it doesn't always work out well, but Neither is it accurate to say that public debt is always a hazard and that it should be avoided at, at all costs. That's the view that we're fighting back against. It was a more controversial view, I think, before the COVID-19 health crisis and pandemic, which in a sense made our case for us. So speaking a little bit more to COVID-19 and the pandemic, um, in the past 18 months, public debt has grown considerably. So what sort of implications do you think that has for the future of the economy or perhaps inflation? In order to answer that question, you have to be a better forecaster than I am. You have to be able to forecast how fast the economy is going to grow. And you have to be able to forecast what's going to happen to interest rates going forward. 
So right now, federal government debt in the hands of the public uh, is about 100% of GDP. There's also a bunch of federal government debt in the hands or on the balance sheet of the central bank, the Federal Reserve. But we don't have to worry about that as directly because uh, the Treasury pays interest to the Fed and the Fed then returns its profits to the Treasury every year. So that's that kind of washes out. But with a federal debt in the hands of, of the public of 100% of GDP and real interest rates adjusted for inflation, currently negative 1%, the real growth of the economy potentially being about 2% of GDP. All that means together that the federal government can run budget deficit of 3% of GDP year after year, every year, without the debt to GDP ratio going up. Uh, that was a lot of arithmetic, I fear. But what it says is that we are going to have to uh, bring down this big government budget deficit of 13% of GDP that we're running today. We don't have to eliminate the deficit, but we're going to need to compress it very significantly to keep the debt burden from exploding. And a deficit of 3% of GDP is not atypical in US history. So I think if we do the right thing, if interest rates remain relatively low and the economy continues to grow, we should be all right for the foreseeable future. But them was a lot of ifs. So I, I wanted to kind of get at something you said a little bit more with COVID-19, um, kind of elaborating what you had said at the end of the previous answer. What is it about the current pandemic that made public debt a little less controversial? in terms of some of the arguments you've laid out in your book that you said would have been a little more controversial even just a couple of years ago? The obvious comparison is with the Obama stimulus in 2009, uh, launched in response to the financial crisis uh, that broke out in 2008. So that one was a lot more controversial because money went to the banks rather than to households and renters and so forth. People said we bailed out the banksters rather than putting food on the table for people who really needed it. And secondly, economists and others worry about what we refer to as moral hazard, that if you provide government transfers in, in a crisis, you're only going to encourage more of the bad behavior that led to the crisis in the first place. So there was a valid argument to that effect in 2009. You will only encourage more risk-taking by the banks that caused the crisis in the first place. I wouldn't exaggerate the weight that should be attached to that argument, but there's something there. In the pandemic, nobody's going to expose themselves to pandemic risk in the future because they got support checks during 2020. So this moral hazard argument that we're making the world a riskier place by running a budget deficit and issuing debt in response to COVID-19 wouldn't hold water. So what role do you think public debt should play in fiscal policy during a pandemic? I basically think what we did during the pandemic was right, was entirely appropriate. The first task was to support people who couldn't go to work. and feed their children and avoid doing lasting damage to people's health if, if they were adults by forcing them to expose themselves at work when that could be avoided, doing lasting damage to their kids through malnutrition. And the second role was in, in, in terms of macroeconomic stabilization, that when private spending declines, public spending needs to step up and substitute for the private spending that has temporarily disappeared. So that's the Keynesian countercyclical fiscal policy argument for issuing debt during a downturn. I think in 2020, the case was first and foremost for supporting people and supporting businesses to avoid lasting damage and all the things I described a moment ago and to prevent businesses 
from unnecessarily going bankrupt during what is hopefully still going to be a passing event. But beyond that, uh, I think there was a macroeconomic argument as well. The fact that unemployment has, has now declined toward 5% from what was looking like a 14% unemployment rate and worse during the early stages of the pandemic has a lot to do with the way we issue debt in order to also stabilize the economy. Yeah, we've talked about using public debt to their benefit or in some cases to their detriment. In the past, how have economies climbed out of mountains of debt? Well, they've climbed out in good ways and bad ways. So the bad or problematic ways are by running a high rate of inflation and basically eroding the real value of the debt. I was talking before about the debt to GDP ratio, how you can only judge the level of the debt by comparing it to the size of the economy. Well, you can artificially blow up the size of the economy by running inflation. If your debt is relatively long term and its value doesn't change as a result of that inflation, you can default on your debt. Just governments can stop paying. Governments have sovereign immunity. There's that word sovereign again, which means that they are immune from legal action with a few exceptions. They can be sued in their own courts which is unlikely to happen. They might be able to get a compliant court or judge to seize one of their airplanes when it lands at at Kennedy Airport or something like that. And things like that have been known to happen on rare occasion. Back in history, and again, we talk about some colorful episodes of this in the book, uh, creditor country governments can send in the gunboats sees the customs house where import taxes are collected. And that has happened in the United States, has done those kind of things in the Caribbean on occasion, much earlier in our history. But those kind of things don't happen in the the somewhat more civilized 21st century. So governments can simply say, you can't bring blood from a stone. We have no more money to pay you. And we're going to not pay at all or only pay 50 cents on the dollar. The other more pleasant ways of dealing with the problem are by growing the economy successfully and by running budget surpluses to pay down some of the accumulated debt. And we look at a bunch of different episodes in in the book and conclude that successful episodes when high debts are brought down or consolidated are those where governments approach the problem from a number of different directions at the same time, growing their economy, strengthening their budgetary position, eliminating large deficits, and maybe running a modicum of inflation. 2% inflation is, or 3% inflation is much more hel- helpful than 2% or 3% deflation for growing out from under a debt burden. So I'm hopeful cautiously, very cautiously hopeful that the United States can continue to grow the economy by 2% per annum, that we can bring our big deficit down, and that the Fed can keep inflation in the 2 to 3% range so as to enable us to keep a handle on the problem. But it's like threading a needle. It's, it's going to be tough, especially in polarized political environment. Yeah, certainly. So thank you so much for your time today, Barry. We really appreciate it. It was fun. Our second guest, Jonathan Ostry, is Deputy Director of the Asia and Pacific Department at the International Monetary Fund. He recently co-authored an article on inequality and pandemics in the journal Industrial and Corporate Change. We spoke about how pandemics, especially COVID-19, can affect inequality and the role of public debt in these situations. I'm happy to be joined by Jonathan Ostry. Uh, can you introduce yourself, please? Hi, Christine. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Jonathan Ostry. I uh, work as uh, a deputy director responsible for the Asia Pacific region at the uh, International Monetary Fund in Washington, D.C. Great. Thank you. Um, so first, can you tell us what is public debt? 
So I'm, I'm assuming that's not a trick question. And if it's not a trick question, then my answer is it's the indebtedness of the government. Uh, and I realize the government is a little ambiguous. It could be the, the central government or general government, including all the subnational governments. It's the debt of the government vis-a-vis -vis the public. So it's the analog of the debt that you and I have for our mortgages and our credit cards, uh, private debt, and this is public debt. So it's the government's debt. It could be debt be the domestic public, in which case it's debt we owe ourselves, where ourselves are the citizens of a country. Or it could be debt vis-a-vis -vis the publics of other countries, in which case it's external public debt, and it's debt we owe to foreigners. So why does public debt matter to governments, and what effect can it have on the global economy? So I, I think public debt matters to governments in part because of the effect it has on the global economy. So the two parts of your question are, are intertwined. I, I'd say there, there are three reasons, three functions of public debt, and this is probably not a textbook answer, but three functions that, that are salient here. One is the fact that running up or running down government debt through budget deficits or budget surpluses, that, that helps to regulate the business cycle of an economy. So when you have a, a shock that takes you below full employment, fiscal policy is often part of the solution, and that has consequences for the evolution of public debt and, and policymakers charged with, with stabilizing the economy toward full employment will, will be very interested in that particular function of, of government debt. A second issue I think has been a lot in the, in the news, especially before the um, the pandemic, but but it is still in the news today, which is the idea that public debt is is very useful for um, uh, upgrading infrastructure, public infrastructure, closing infrastructure gaps, roads, airports, educational institutions, all of the all of the public investment goods where government has a role, you generally don't want to find, uh, finance you know, an increase in the public capital stock by taxing people more. You generally want to finance it through public debt, just like a firm doesn't want to finance all of its uh, capital expenditures through retained earnings. It wants to uh, borrow or, or issue equity and so forth. So, so uh, there is a role for public debt in terms of having the right public capital stock, I would say. Um, and then there's a third reason I think that is very important um, uh, why governments care about uh, public debt is because we don't know exactly how much public debt is the right amount, the optimal amount of public debt. And that probably depends uh, on many different things. And I would, I would also add there that um, the economics profession seems uh, very undecided uh, about what the right level of public debt is. Um, uh, and we have uh, seminal papers in our discipline that suggest the right level of public debt could be negative, i.e. the government should accumulate assets in order to uh, have something uh, in store for a rainy day to um, you know, some modest uh, positive number to some, some rather higher number. So we don't know what the optimal level of public debt is. But we also don't, there's a certain amount of uncertainty about what level of public debt is going to unnerve uh, the bond markets and amplify the risk of a fiscal crisis. And crises are very politically costly for governments. So politicians in power uh, don't want to preside over um, uh, some market-driven crisis because they let fiscal policy and government debt uh, get out of hand. And so they want to stay well away from levels of public debt that are going to unnerve, uh, unnerve markets. So there's this concept of fiscal space, which is how much room for maneuver uh, do governments have given the level of public debt? How much can they run that level up before getting to a sort of tipping point where the markets are going to pick on the country and say its fiscal position is unsustainable uh, and there'll be a massive sell-off in the capital markets of government debt. And that will be economically, of course, extremely costly and also politically costly. And ultimately, governments care about the political economy of public debt. In your article in the journal Industrial and Corporate Change, you and your co-authors write that major epidemics of the last two decades, such as SARS and H1N1, have been followed by increases in inequality. So how can epidemics affect inequality? 
So when we came to this question, there was a fairly established literature on um, how pandemics in history would affect, had affected uh, inequality and in the distribution of income. And there was a very influential book by Walter Scheidel called uh, The Great Leveler that argued that um, if you look at an episode like the Black Death many centuries ago, the upshot of the Black Death was uh, an increase in equality, a reduction in inequality. And the mechanism to, to simplify drastically was that a tremendous number of people, scores and scores of people died as a result of the Black Death. And the deaths occurred disproportionately uh, amongst the poor and amongst the, the, the lower segments of society. And so there was a, a, a classic you know, supply demand kind of effect that, that ensued, whereby you know, unskilled labor could command a premium in the aftermath of the Black Death because there were so many fewer workers. And when we initially presented this work, um, I remember the first presentation I gave in an academic seminar uh, where a number of the, of the academics in the room were, had an economic history uh, background. And that was certainly what they were thinking. And we, as your question indicated, we, we had a different result. And they were, they were a little puzzled. Uh, why, why should the uh, result be so different when you look at major epidemics and pandemics from this century. And I think the answer is that um, the main channel that operated many, many centuries ago, which was a huge number of deaths, was very mercifully not going to occur this time around because of the progress of science and medicine. Of course, we, we see on the evening news every day uh, that yet there are, are very many more deaths that occur and by, by the standards of the 21st century, um, there have been a, a, a very great number of deaths um, uh, worldwide from this pandemic, but uh, they pale in comparison to what we saw centuries ago. And so the evolution of inequality was not going to operate in the same way, in our view, uh, as it did centuries ago. And even if you look, say, you know, one century ago at, at say, the Spanish flu, and there are studies that, that suggest, for example, that if you look at the incidence of, of the Spanish flu across Italy in different, in different Italian towns, you do find that basically where the, where the pandemic was more severe, you tended to see um, a greater adverse uh, impact on equality. So there are some studies that I think that uh, even a century ago cast doubt on the finding from the Middle Ages that, that we had with, with, um, with Scheidel's work. But so what we did is we, we collected these data on the major epidemics from this century because we thought that would be a more period of time where the sort of institutions were going to be uh, more similar to what we have today in terms of informing you know, what the likely evolution. Um, and, and what we found, as you said, was that um, inequality uh, seems to rise in the aftermath of pandemics. And it, it, it rises a little bit in the first year, but the, the increase tends to get worse over time. So it's not something that is going to go away on its own, according to our findings, but it's something that's going to build unless there is policy action. And, and some of the mechanisms, which is what your question was, was asking about, I think relate to the fact that those at the bottom of the totem pole, those with less skills, less telecommunicable jobs, poorer members of society, uh, they tend to have greater vulnerabilities uh, along many different uh, dimensions. So I think one of the things we learned is that either those at the bottom of the totem pole were in types of jobs that were more likely to disappear and disappear not just temporarily, but permanently when a pandemic hit. And if they were in uh, essential jobs, uh, they, they could not telecommute nearly as well as people with, with higher levels of skill and, and education. And so they had to travel uh, to their place of employment and put their health in, in harm's way. 
uh, they tended to have uh, less access to uh, good quality health care. And so if they got sick, that tended to uh, get compounded over time and they, they faced a greater vulnerability to actually die as a result of contracting this disease. And, uh, you know, they, they tended all around to be more vulnerable uh, to the aftermath of the pandemic. They tended to be in informal sectors uh, that could not be uh, reached by safety nets and so forth. So they lost their jobs, they got sicker, they were more likely to die uh, and so forth. And those are some of the, the channels that mediate this increase in inequality in the aftermath of, of a pandemic. So you talked a lot about how certain folks are more vulnerable to the aftermath of the pandemic due to their working situations and different things like that. What policies can prevent an increase in inequality after or even like right now, like during the pandemic that we're still in? So one of the things that we looked at was, you know, as, as you say, what, what is the role of, uh, of public policy in an event like the one we're going through? And I think that has a multifaceted answer. And the, the paper we're talking about really only deals with one aspect of it. But, but I think you, you need to fill that out a little bit with, with healthcare policy. I mean, obviously, at this stage of, of the pandemic, uh, job one is really uh, trying to ensure and achieve uh, rapid universal access to vaccines at an affordable price. Uh, and that is uh, something that is achievable uh, in, uh, if, if uh, countries cooperate and collaborate. And I think if there's adequate funding and uh, all the logistical aspects of that, of that humongous problem get sorted out, which I think is within the power of the international community to achieve. I think, you know, at, at, at earlier stages of the pandemic, we really wanted to make sure that, that the whole range of, of non-pharmaceutical in interventions and pharmaceutical interventions um, were, were being effectively deployed. And uh, that when uh, lockdowns were necessary from a, from a health point of view, that governments were, were stepping in with uh, financial resources to protect uh, the, the most uh, vulnerable in society, uh, both, both firms and, uh, and businesses, uh, to keep them running so that what economists refer to as, as scarring in the aftermath of the pandemic uh, whereby firms that uh, temporarily need to uh, shut down don't in the end come back. And so there's a permanent loss in the capacity of, of economies to uh, produce goods and services and to generate uh, prosperity on a sustained basis. So we worry about that scarring and we believe that policies, health policies and economic policies in the teeth of the pandemic are very important, both for minimizing short-term costs and also laying a foundation for a solid medium run recovery with as little scarring as possible. But the, the issue that we focus on in our, in our paper has to do with, um, with fiscal policy. And what we show is that you can learn a lot about the evolution of inequality in the aftermath of the pandemic uh, from the course uh, of, uh, of fiscal policy in the years of the pandemic and the years following the pandemic. Uh, and what you, what you find when you do that, whether you look at fiscal policy in a very aggregated uh, sense, like, like uh, the fiscal deficit, the fiscal balance, or you look at a narrower definition of, of fiscal policy, uh, uh, say focused on uh, how many uh, resources are devoted to healthcare spending. In either of those indicators, what you see is that when um, fiscal policy is very austere, so there is a fast return to, um, to fiscal consolidation, to what some people refer to as fiscal austerity, on either of those measures, the increase in inequality uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic is much larger than it is in a situation where fiscal support, again, on either of these uh, measures, remains uh, generous and targeted appropriately at the most vulnerable until 
there can be a smooth handoff from public demand to private demand, and there is a self-sustained momentum in, in private demand. So it is within the power of fiscal policy to significantly moderate uh, the increase in inequality in the aftermath of pandemics. Indeed, so much so that where, where fiscal policy is generous and um, uh, is able to be sustained for a period of time that is long enough for the private sector to itself propel the economy forward, where it is, where it is sufficiently generous to do that, um, you can avoid uh, the increase in inequality um, altogether in the aftermath of the pandemic. And I think that is really the litmus test of a successful fiscal policy here, because remember, in a lot of countries where inequality is a problem today, uh, it was a problem, a significant problem, a significant policy challenge in the years running up to the pandemic. So we were not in a good place uh, before the pandemic fell on us in terms of the level of inequality in many countries. And so what we don't need is to have this shock add further and ratchet up again uh, the level of inequality. And I have to say that in the absence of a concerted policy drive to, uh, to overturn that outcome, the baseline is a further ratcheting up. Uh, in inequality. What I, what I said at the beginning, that the effect of the pandemic uh, seems to persist over the medium term and indeed is larger over the medium term than it is uh, in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic, that suggests that there would be persistent ratcheting up of inequality in the absence of a, uh, of a major policy effort. Um, it seems like governments have to manage fiscal policies that can help reduce inequalities while also being concerned about the level of public debt, is that right? So one of the things I think we uh, learned in the aftermath of the global financial crisis a little over a decade ago is that there was a, a good degree of fiscal response globally, cooperatively, in the um, initial period of the global financial crisis. But governments uh, were not in it for uh, the longer haul, and they moved uh, toward a more austere fiscal stance before private uh, economic growth was propelling itself forward. And as a result, we had uh, a more tepid economic recovery in the years after the global financial crisis than I think was desirable. And uh, indeed, I think it was possible to avoid this tepid economic recovery altogether if uh, fiscal policy had stayed in the fight a little bit longer. And I think that experience is, uh, is seared in the minds of, of policymakers today, um, and they want to try and avoid withdrawing fiscal support uh, too soon because they recognize that doing that will be self-defeating in the sense that you will wind up, if you, if you withdraw support prematurely, with a more tepid, weaker recovery, and then a worse trajectory, I think, as a result in public debt in relation to the size of the economy. But of course, you know, not everybody has the fiscal space, and coming back to that concept I laid out at the beginning, not everyone has the fiscal space that they can stick it out for the longer haul. And so, you know, the advice uh, has to be differentiated and the policy response has to be differentiated according to how much fiscal space uh, countries have. Just because uh, not everyone uh, has enough fiscal space to stick it out for the longer haul doesn't mean that nobody does. And so there are countries, I think what I would call green zone countries, where they retain even after the massive run up uh, in fiscal debt and fiscal support that we have seen uh, thus far during the pandemic, they still retain substantial fiscal space. And we see uh, middle-income and poorer countries that have a good deal less fiscal space now and that had a good deal less fiscal space going into this pandemic. And that is why they uh, were less able to provide fiscal support than some of the richer industrialized countries. So public debt and fiscal space are always going to be constraints 
on the room for maneuver uh, that countries have. But I think the message we are saying is that if you have fiscal space, it is self-defeating uh, to withdraw fiscal support prematurely. You end up with uh, weaker growth and a worse public debt path than if you stick it out. So it seems like you're saying it is not inevitable, but is an increase in inequality inevitable due to COVID-19? So I think I would say two things. I would say that if the past uh, is any guide, it seems that it is uh, the baseline forecast that there would be an increase in inequality uh, after this pandemic. But I think policymakers keep inequality as a central policy target. It is within the capacity of uh, policy tools that, that we have to short circuit the channels uh, that we saw operating in the earlier pandemics uh, this century, the earlier epidemics this century. So fiscal support is obviously central to achieving that objective. I think more broadly, the nature of globalization that we are seeking in the uh, third decade of this century has also to be on the table. So, you know, pandemics are not the only thing, of course, that um, that is uh, driving inequality today um, and that has been driving inequality in the years and decades leading up to this pandemic. There are many factors and indeed a number of them are, are controlled for in our study, but the nature of globalization uh, and the hyper-globalization that we have you know, walked into since the 1990s is something that I, I do think has to be uh, on the table, looked at from a policy perspective, and whether in particular financial globalization, which is the subject of active debate and where um, I think there is mounting evidence that financial globalization has a sort of worse equity efficiency trade-off than say trade globalization, which I think hasn't had nearly the same wrap in terms of the effects on inequality that financial globalization has had, and clearly has a much well established track record of having uh, propelled billions of people out of poverty and closed income gaps through uh, goods trade uh, across the globe. So, so I think the nature of globalization is also something uh, beyond fiscal policy that is relevant for containing the rise in inequality in the years and decades after uh, uh, after the pandemic. So, will this time be different? So, I, I think that is the that is the bottom line question, and and I guess my answer is no, unless unless a, a bunch of things change. I think attitudes and policies really do need to change. We've had a lot of talk that gives one grounds for optimism. But of course, talk is cheap. We've also had good policy action in the first 18 months of this pandemic. But of course, what we learn is that that policy action really needs to be sustained even once the pandemic begins uh, to recede. And I think so attitudes and policies really need to change. I think uh, we've talked a little bit about the need to restore globalization with inclusiveness explicitly in mind. Um, I think we've talked about fiscal policy and the need for public debt to be pared back slowly uh, in green zone countries. And I think uh, one thing we, we haven't touched upon, but I think is, is very important, uh, is that oftentimes these dislocating events uh, like pandemics give rise to quantum increase in, in automation, and that could really uh, that can really affect disproportionately those at the bottom of the totem pole especially unskilled, uh, lower skilled labor. And so we have to be able to um, reap the benefits from greater automation in a way that they become more widely shared in society. So those would be, uh, I think, the, the four areas that I would want to uh, know the answer to before saying whether this time will, will be different. If, if progress along those four dimensions is not achieved, then my baseline answer is this time would not be different. That was all very interesting. Thank you for sharing your time and insights with us on the podcast. My pleasure, Christine. Uh, good to be with you. We want to thank our guests, 
Barry Eigengreen, co-author of the new book, In Defense of Public Debt, and Jonathan Ostry, Deputy Director of the Asia and Pacific Department of the International Monetary Fund, for joining us today. Please check out our show notes on the OUP blog for more information about their work, along with a suggested reading list that provides even more context for understanding public debt and inequality. New episodes of the Oxford Comment will premiere on the last Tuesday of each month. Be sure to follow OUP Academic on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, and YouTube to stay up to date on upcoming podcast episodes. While you're at it, please subscribe to the Oxford Comment wherever you regularly listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or Stitcher. Lastly, we want to thank the crew of the Oxford Comment for their assistance on today's episode. Episode 65 was produced by Stephen Philippi, Aaron Cox, and me, Christine Scalora. Thank you for listening. <laughs>